responsibility of the program, research and advocacy. He works very closely with the partners to advance social accountability for the UHC in Kenya. Welcome, Dr. Ndrangu. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Josephat. And uh, allow me to say hi, everyone. And uh, I'm very, very pleased to once again welcome each one of you to this uh, one hour webinar. Uh, this webinar, as you have seen, is a second in a series of webinars building up to the Africa Health Agenda International Conference that will happen uh, from 5th to 7th of March 2019 in Kigali, Rwanda. The conference in Rwanda will have four themes, namely access, quality, financing, and accountability. And today's webinar is about accountability, enhancing governance and accountability at national, regional, and global levels to achieve universal health coverage. Uh, remember, you will have the opportunity to ask any questions you may have. As the webinar goes on, type the questions you have using the chat function of this link. And in case you have any challenge, remember you can send also a message about your challenge, and we have an IT team that will be able to sort you out. And the speakers will respect, respond to the questions at the end. And in the event we are not able to respond to some of the questions, then we'll be able to respond after the webinar. Today, we are privileged to have three speakers, and I would like to now introduce each one of them. Uh, to start with, we have Dr. Delano Dovlo. Uh, Dr. Delano Dovlo is a former director of health systems and services at WHO Regional Office for Africa, Afro, Brazzaville, Congo, uh, from where he retired in July 2018. He previously served as WHO representative to Rwanda and health systems advisor at WHO headquarters. And he brings on board over 35 years clinical and public health experience, which includes being director of human resources development in the Ministry of Health of Ghana and consulting for various organizations, including the World Bank, UNICEF, and DFID on health system strengthening and health sector reforms. Dr. Doflo qualified as a physician from the University of Ghana Medical School and has an MPH from the University of Leeds in UK. He obtained the membership of the West Africa College of Physicians and is a foundation fellow of the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons. We are very, very happy to have you on board, uh, Dr. Dovlo. We are looking forward to hearing what you have to offer. Uh, moving on, I'm very, very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Belly Begashow. Dr. Begashow is the Director General of the Sustainable Development Goals Center for Africa, uh, Kigali, Rwanda. Uh, prior to being appointed as the Director General, Dr. Begashow was the founding director of the Columbia Global Centers for Africa, which he joined in January 2009. He also served as the Associate Director of the Agriculture and Food Security Center of the Earth Institute. He brings on board over 20 years of experience in agriculture extension and rural development, including having been Minister of Agriculture for Ethiopia. Dr. Begashu has done extensive consulting work and advisory work for several organizations uh, in the area of food security, poverty reduction and investment, climate change, resilience building, development finance, and governance. Uh, he earned his uh, Master of Public Administration degree from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, and also a Master of Science degree from the University of Reading. Uh, Dr. Begashu, we are very, very happy to have you on board in this webinar, and we're looking forward to engaging with you shortly. Then, last but not least, we have uh, uh, Evarin Carijo seated right, right with me here. Evarin Carijo is the director of Y Act, or Youth in Action, an initiative of AMREF Health Africa and the Advocacy Accelerator, and the fastest growing network of youth advocates and youth advocacy organizations in the region. Why Act, or Youth in Action, promotes meaningful youth engagement in policy and decision-making processes with a focus on gender equality and sexual and reproductive health and rights. Evarine is a public health specialist 
and she holds a global executive MBA from the United States International University of Africa. She is the chairperson of Africa Health Agenda 2019 Youth Pre-Conference that will focus on youth, on youth skills building and will culminate, culminate with the development of a toolkit on meaningful youth engagement to achieve universal health coverage, including policy, social accountability, and how youth engage with policymakers. So welcome, Evelyn. We're very, very happy to have you on board Thank you. Uh, representing uh, Youth Voices. Thank you. We, I would like to appreciate all our three speakers for accepting our request to be the speakers for this webinar. And I would like us to dive into the webinar itself. And to begin with, I would like to invite Dr. Dovlo uh, to share with us his pers perspectives on our topic of today, which is governance and accountability for universal health coverage. Dr. Dovlo, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dovlo. Uh, I hope uh, the audio, audio seems to be getting a bit of it. All right. Um, I would like to start off and uh, share some of the slides uh, that I have. Um, sorry. Sorry. Uh, sorry for that technical hitch. Uh, just, okay. just a moment. Okay. Yeah. I think it's showing now. Show yes, it is. It is. Okay, excellent. Okay. And I'll just dive straight into what I have, what to, I have say. to say. I'd like to start off this discussion around governance and accountability, accountability. with the, the, the uh, challenge that we have. And what you see on your screens is a chart, a chart. that shows UHP proxy that was a work The key thing here is that only about eight of those in the green are those that I didn't universal health coverage. If we measure that through coverage, and out-of-pocket expenditures, which remain quite high in our region. And some of the largest, most populous countries remain in the red with very low service coverage and high out-of-pocket uh, expenditures. Now, uh, secondly, I would like to move on to the issue of a framework that was developed last year and accepted, adopted by the Ministers of Health in Victoria Falls. The key point I'd like to raise about this is that in the past, we've tended to focus when looking at systems and looking at UHC on the inputs. But this time, this helps us to focus on the outputs and the outcomes so that we make sure that the investments we are making in health produce certain results that impact on the health and well being of our population. And I'll come back to this again. Uh, later on in the in the discussions. The idea is that whilst often our politicians like to put up a new building or to say so many more nurses have been trained, our focus should be on ensuring that those investments produce health. The third thing I would like to mention as we start this discussion is also about the fact that despite the heavy health burden that we have as a region, we also need to consider the fact that we are in a rapidly changing world. And one of the major challenges that face us is around looking at the issues that will impact us in future and undermine the health systems and services and the, uh, uh, our SDG goals that we are trying to, uh, uh, to set up. Let me mention this very quickly. One is that there's grave inequity and inequality in access to services and in health outcomes across the region. About every country has some of these problems. The second is that we are tackling a triple burden of disease, unlike most other regions. In particular, that we have a non-communicable diseases burden that is becoming very large and important, for which we often have little donor support. 
and we tended to focus on those areas where there are donor uh, investments available. And it's critically important that when we are talking about accountability, it is for those things that affect our population, not only for those things that are popular and have donor support. Third, there are certain changes affecting our region. One is urbanization. The second is the demographic transition with both youthful and elderly populations increasing. The third is economic wealth, many more middle-income countries coming up and what this means for lifestyle and uh, changes in the type of health issues that we face, social cultural challenges, and of course, climate and environmental transitions that also impact on health security and uh, the frequency of outbreaks and so on that we have. The fourth item I'd like to mention quickly is the way we invest in health, which is often fragmented, coming from a variety of sources, channeled in so many different directions that sometimes we overinvest in certain areas, undermine other areas, and we do not get the health results that we want. And one of the things we need to be accountable for is making sure that our investments are not fragmented and that our institutions are capable of managing these investments in a way that will produce uh, health. One example we found out is if you look at a number of our countries and the budget planning that they make for health, and the investment that they plan to make and you compare it to the actual expenditure, it's often quite different. And next is the fact that we have huge economic cost of health. Our estimate is about $2.5 trillion is lost per year. That's at 19, uh, 2015 values. We estimate that about 50% of this almost will be gained back if we meet the SDGs by 2030. And so this is an important point where we need to see that countries are making the investment that would also pull our economies out of the problems they have currently. And so what are the capacities that we need, the mechanisms that would allow us to, one, govern effectively and be better accountable? And the chart that I'm showing now tries to demonstrate that. We held a, a small technical expert group meeting in Brazzaville last year brainstormed around what are the capacities that we need to work on in order to get better governance and accountability. And let me quickly mention some of these. One is that our institutions need the authority and mandate that they need, that the organizational structures and the way the organizations work should be in such a way that it produces the results that we want. We require policy, regulatory, and legal systems we need to have better accountability systems. I'll talk a bit more about that later. We need to have good intelligence and knowledge management to inform whether we are achieving what we want to achieve or not. We need better stakeholder engagement and of course, critical leadership and management skills. But the last and not the least is ways of mitigating corruption and building conf uh, public confidence in our system. And so how do we go about taking into consideration this accountability and governance that we are talking about? And I would like to suggest a few things and give some examples that we find in the region. One is we need to have a better mapping of the stakeholders in the countries. I see a system sometimes as I was working where we seem to be more accountable to the donors than to our populations. And in so doing, missing the map on those things that are important for Secondly, once we have the stakeholders, no matter where they come from, they need to have the capacity to engage on an equal footing with the government and with all the other partners in order to be effective. We need to have good data and evidence systems, and we need to have a good center that coordinates the efforts and roles of all the stakeholders, the politicians, the decision makers, the health technocrats, the civil society groups, citizens and communities, the donors, partnerships, think tanks, and then in particular, the government departments that are responsible for uh, holding investments accountable. Accountant generals, attorney generals, auditor generals, that in many countries are probably not as effective as they should be. And when we come to the examples, then I want to look at three main areas. One is the performance reviews that are carried out in many countries. Some of them technical, some uh, more around political and policy levels. 
uh, Ghana holds annual summits on health. It has district uh, health directors meetings that look at holding annual evaluations to see where they are moving on. How this is used to ensure movement is perhaps a gateway. Similar events happen in Kenya and in South Africa. Uh, some of these areas is a strong engagement with parliament and with um, other groups that are enabled to uh, uh, hold certain systems accountable. And as we are working with AMREV, I'd like to mention in particular, they work with civil society organizations in enabling a certain social accountability framework that tries to enable community groups, uh, societal groups, and other non-governmental organizations role in ensuring that there's good governance and accountability. And perhaps we talk a bit more about this. For performance contracts, I think Rwanda is the one that least several countries have this, but the Imigo, the Imihigo system, as it is called, which works, and Dr. Begashaw may be familiar with this. And what this does is put a certain onus on district leadership to deliver certain results. And, and, and these are measurable results uh, for where they cover. Final area that I would like to talk about is around the evidence and transparency of the data and the work that is available. At one time, Uganda used to have these district leak tables that allowed us to see which districts were performing better than others and gave a certain competitive impetus. They also have the speed, which is a think tank based at the University of Makarere that reviews health policy and its implementation as a way of holding government's feet to the fire to ensure that these things are taking place. In Ghana, there's one called Imani, not only focused on health, but on general governance and, and well-being. And of course, uh, we, uh, there's been an effort to put national health observatories in about every country. So what are the things, as I come to an end, should we be looking at? One is that we want that focus on outputs and outcomes to be what is important. What is the service coming? Are people getting the scope of services that they need to have? Very important is, as you saw in the first chart that I showed, there's a high proportion of countries with high out-of-pocket expenditure as part of their total health expenditure. We must monitor that this is reduced. Without that, we shall not have UHC. Thirdly, we need to, of course, continue to look at the inputs, the human resources, the medicines, and making sure we have effective data systems, for example, that services are demanded as an effect of our our health promotion and that people are satisfied with the services. We need to anticipate the future as I've heard and hold governments accountable to those things that are going to challenge us very soon and undermine our economic growth. And also, in addition, we need to be clearer as to how we identify vulnerable population groups within each country. They'll be different in every country and we need to be focused on finding out who they are and to hold governments accountable. The fact that they are small populations, they are disabled or marginalized groups should not uh, keep them away from uh, uh, benefiting from UHC. And the final point I'd like to raise here is around countries must increase the domestic resources that they put into total expenditure. I see that as what will help us go with sustainability when the resources are mostly our own. And that's one thing that we need to measure as well. And so, Mr. Moderator, with that, I would like to leave uh, the, the, the webinar with these thoughts that I have to give a general picture. And I hope my colleagues, speakers, will follow up on some of the other areas in detail. Thank you very much. Uh, articulation of the issues, uh, bringing out the issues of uh, the need to understand capacity, evidence, coordination, and also clarity on the what we should measure. Uh, I think that's spot on. I think uh, in order to save time, uh, we'll get the questions later. So we'd like to go to uh, Dr. Begashow, uh, and I invite you, Dr. Begashow, uh, to also uh, share your insights into this topic of uh, governance and accountability at global, regional, country levels in order to take us closer to UHC. Welcome, Dr. Begashu. 
Then can we start checking? <clears throat> um, I think Dr. Doblo um, gave us a very good, <clears throat> actually, um, and comprehensive information about what's going on in these areas. So I just want to see how we can link this with uh, the SDGs, um, both at global, national, and regional level, and also see how um, actually um, we can um, deal with some kind of accountability that cross cut, um, but at the same time also focusing on certain things, not only on how much, um, but also you know what quality of services that we are supposed to render in order to be able to meet this very very demanding UHC. Um, you know, high bar that the SDG has put up. Um, to start with, um, I think the SDG has given us a very um, <clears throat> strong platform. Um, this is, uh, you know, mobilizing um, everyone towards this um, same targets in a very time bounded fashion, which is not the case in the past. So this is huge. Um, it's unprecedented. The level of convergence that we have witnessed is unprecedented. And also a level of uh, understanding um, and, and involvement and engagement across the board is, I mean, nothing has been given us this um, like uh, what SDG has got. So we have to take advantage of that and push this very, very, um, daunting, but at the same time, doable agenda. Um, interestingly, UHC is not, um, you know, exclusively um, developing all of the issues. Um, countries like US, um, who are capable of uh, putting $2.8 trillion every year um, for health budget, are still way, way far from meeting um, the kind of you know, equity and access and quality in health services. And also, you know, the uh, third important thing that you see is advocating for um, delivering these services without financial burden. So the whole idea is it is not about money. It's about leadership. It's about the quality of management that we are putting in place that help us meet UHCs um, because money alone will not take us anywhere. Um, so that's why we're saying that when we talk about accountability, we have to talk about, um, you know, uh, what level of um, professional integrity that we're putting here, um, particularly knowing that almost 300,000, uh, you know, women, according to the WHO uh, 2015 data, almost 300,000 women um, die um, from, you know, giving birth and also related um, consequential <clears throat> um, issues. Um, it is actually what kind of, what level of professional integrity, what level of uh, commitment and what level of um, support to uh, people in this area uh, is something that we should focus on. So when it comes to global governance, right now, um, one of the major issues around SDG is there is no clear global governance. Not, this is not only for the health, it is happening for COP21. So this is a major issue around SDGs. If countries are reporting, they are reporting voluntarily. If they are, they are not only reporting voluntarily, but they are even picking what to report on voluntarily. So it is very difficult actually to um, get hold of them um, because there is no clear mechanism on this. More importantly, uh, because everybody is reporting in different ways on different issues, on different things, it is even difficult to make comp and contrast because um, not everyone is reporting on the same thing. So right now, um, I think the best way is to go uh, goals by goals the way we are doing now for health and, and advocates for accountability. 
And uh, the fact that most of uh, the health system issues are well standardized and there are clear normatives also you know, being built over time around health. Um, I think if we push that, um, you know, we will be able actually to have some kind of um, reporting mechanism that would start all the way from um, the bottom um, because, you know, the SDG is not only about the top apex level, but it's mainly about 30, 40% of um, the, you know, population at the bottom level. Um, I think the, <clears throat> the using those kind of norms and standards, if we put in place clear scorecard system, um, which will take actually social contracts, particularly on the service um, at the bottom level that I mentioned, and also that scorecard should not only be um, you know, on the government services, but also bring everyone together every service render at that level, be it private sector or non-governmental institution. Um, in case of health, as you know, the private health system includes NGOs as well, and other organizations like church and other organizations who are putting a lot of resources around health. If we mainstream this effort into the scorecard, we will be able to have something very strong that cross all the way from the bottom to top level. The second important thing may be is um, we have to take into account how uh, the geopolitical variation um, is um, you know, a huge issue when it comes to Africa. Um, those SDGs are you know, launched in every country um, you know, at the global level, which is 193 countries, um, but not every country has the same starting point. Um, this is particularly important when we consider health system development in Africa. We have very um, huge issues around health investment right now in Africa. The health infrastructure is very much um, backward. Um, the health capacity is another very important issue that we have to consider. We still Talk about um, you know one um, doctor for one thousand population. We are still talking about uh, you know three nurses to thousand population. We are still talking about three midwives to thousand. This is huge disadvantage for Africa to echo. So we took into account this and try to understand what it takes to meet SDG three, particularly when it comes to resources in Africa. Um, the per capita cost lies around 100 pay 120 per person, um, which is US dollar. That means we might need to have um, something in the range of $21 billion, an incremental investment cost in order to be able to meet SDG series in Africa. This is about seven to eight percent of the GDP, right? And uh, guess what? Education is taking this much and infrastructure is going you know, to even uh, double, triple. So we are in a very uh, precarious situation when it comes to SDG resource. And in the meantime, the expected resource that are actually to be contributed for um, the SDGs, particularly on the 0.7% of GNI, that SDG is advocating from official sources of the OECD countries. Um, we are not only able to meet this resource, uh, we're still you know, in the range of 3.32%, but also in the last two years, this is going down because US and other contributors uh, who are known to be with the highest GNI pool of um, and, and cut these resources by 40, 50%. So we are in a very, again, you know, <clears throat> um, scary situations. Three years down the line, we're not um, actually close to meeting even those, um, you know, uh, activities that are supposed to be covered in the last three years. And this is piling because on the SDGs, as you know, we are not 
planning from present to the future, we are planning from future to present because the future is already set uh, due to um, the agreement that we have on every single target that we have to meet 15 years um, from September 2015. So if we don't do things today, you are not actually you know, going away from that thing, but you are piling it for tomorrow. So three years down the line, nothing has happened. And then we remain with 12 years, but with no indication where the resource is coming from. So we are in a huge situation. And we were trying to, to see how the domestic resource, um, you know, or raising domestic resource contributes. This is, um, again, uh, very fantastic. I mean, the maximum we can do on this is, you know, 5% of the GDP. Um, if we are able to increase taxes um, in each country, and uh, taxpayers are very limited, um, up to 50, 60% of um, the, the, the youth groups are not employed, and those who are employed also, they are not capable of paying much. So we are in this situation. So the accountability, the global accountability comes here. The global system should be accountable for the promise that they made. And the national system has to find out a way to ratify this thing, to put these plans as part and par parcel of the you know, national plans that they are putting. And as I mentioned earlier, at the grassroots level, we have to find out a scorecard a system that will help accountable everyone, not only the government system, but all other health system actors together. So if we set these three things in, at three different levels, we will be able to push this agenda a little bit um, better than what we are doing right now. So what kind of consortium? I think, uh, uh, again, um, this is well said earlier, but um, I think we need to uh, bring everyone on board. I think there is no way that we can do this thing unless we uh, continue to be um, you know, very transparent and open, um, not only on the plans and, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, the achievement reports that we are having, but also on the way uh, how we can bring these issues up in different forums. We cannot continue adopting the agendas. We have to set agendas. We have to um, engage everyone at all levels in order to be able their voice to be heard. And the last and most important part is everything that we should we do, it should be evidence-based, absolutely. But these evidences are not only evidences that help us um, actually analyze and understand it, these things compartment by compartments, but also this is something that we need to build how we can see things in synergies uh, because the SDGs are about synergies. Whatever we do in, in agriculture and nutrition will contribute to health um, achievements. And also the other way around, if you don't well, do well on these things, no matter how good the health system uh, resource and, and the accountability system we build, um, I think we will not be able to tap those improvements the way we can, because we, you know, when you uh, gain from the synergies, you will have a linear kind of um, improvement in your in your targets and and, uh, um, and indicators. But when you have negative, which is trade-off, you will lose twice, three times because. The situation um, is like losing, um, you know, uh, on every segment of those um, uh, information that you will need to build the synergies in that nexuses. So we are in this situation. We need our health system should actually be able to capture um, synergies and uh, um, synergies and and trade-offs, um, uh, <coughs> uh, understanding these elements are actually the. Um, very fine norm of uh, the day if we have to work um, comprehensively in SDGs. So these are the points that I would like to contribute at this stage, and then I think we might come back when during the Q and A. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Begashu, for uh, that presentation. Uh, very well putting the this subject within the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals, the value of reporting, the use of scorecards the critical role of leadership, the challenges and, and opportunities in, in financing uh, here in Africa. 
thank you. Uh, we'll have questions after a couple of minutes, and we'd like to move right to the next, uh, the last speaker, uh, Evarin Carijo. Uh, welcome, Evarin Carijo. Share with us uh, uh, your contribution to this conversation. Remember, the conversation is about governance and accountability. Uh, at all levels, global, regional, and national, uh, towards UHC. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Mesha. I think this is quite exciting because I get to give this entire conversation the youth perspective and the youth lens. Imagine the impact that we would have if every young person, not just in Africa, but across the globe, had the means, had the capacity to achieve his or her full potential. With a youth population of over 3 billion right now globally, we'd make great advancements to economies in each country, but then we'd also advance achievements to universal health coverage and, of course, the sustainable development goals uh, that Dr. Dovlo and Dr. Begasho have talked about. But we can only achieve these commitments at national, regional, and global level if we have young people on the table, if the youth voices are heard when it comes to governance and accountability, and if the perspectives are taken into consideration. So when it comes to youth engagement in, a, in accountability and governance for UHC, I'd like to talk about two issues. One, the adequacy or inadequacy of data, um, specifically on adolescents and youth. And Dr. Dovla has mentioned a bit about uh, data. I'll also talk about young people working in systematic and structured ways um, in governance processes. So when it comes to data, governments and stakeholders have made a bit of progress in ensuring that we have data that is disaggregated by age and sex. However, if young people and adolescents need to take part in accountability effectively, we need to have data that is context-specific to the issues that affect young people and adolescents. We need to see data that talks about the geographic location of young people and how these affect access to health services, we need to see data that gives insight to marginalized young people in different humanitarian settings and the kind of health services that they need. We need to see data that talks about the key populations for young people and the services that they need, including sexual and productive health services. So governments and stakeholders need to ensure that young people have this data that is not just disaggregated, but it is available on all platforms and platforms that are youth-friendly, including social media and all. But we young people also have a role to play in ensuring that we have data that um, influences or rather talks to our priorities. So as young people, we need to work with uh, provide health service providers and governments to give feedback on the quality of services and the type of services that we are receiving. We as young people need to give feedback um, on the kind of um, attitude the health workers have when it comes to treating young people and providing services to young people. In giving feedback, then we're able to contribute to ensuring that we have data for us to be able to track, monitor, and of course ensure that governments and stakeholders are accountable to commitments that um, they have made. We as young people need also to advocate for um, resources to data whenever we see gaps. The second thing that I'll talk about is um, young people working in systematic approaches. A lot of literature has shown that youth participation in governance has been fragmented and uncoordinated. And this is a bit unfortunate considering our great um, population. So um, stakeholders and governments need to, and youth serving organizations need to ensure that young people have the tools, have the capacity, and of course the resources to be able to formalize the organizations and the structures, and to be meaningfully engaged in decision making. And for, um, of course, everyone in governance, you need to ensure that young people are not just included in the governance process at the tail end. Young people need to be involved in the entire cycle of policy and decision making, right from the design of policies to the implementation to monitoring and evaluating these policies. We need to ensure that young people in our organized structures that we have um, scorecards and that we have tools. I know Dr. Begash has talked a bit about scorecards. We need to ensure that we have scorecards that are in line with the priorities um, of young people and adolescents when it comes to health issues. We have quite a number of case studies that have worked when it comes to youth being organized and working in um, systematic approaches and using scorecards. And I'll just talk about two AMREF projects. Um, one here in Kenya, where young people in Siaya County have been supported to set up the Ugunza Youth Parliament. So what young people have done is to model 
the health committees within the county assembly, which is basically the legislative arm in the county government. So young people within their structured um, ways have been able to keep track of commitments that the executive has made, but also have been able to take part in public finance management by monitoring how budgets are being uh, prepared, how resources are being allocated, and through their efforts, they've been able to actually influence allocation um, of resources to sexual and productive health services within the entire county. Of course, I have to talk about the uh, Act Youth in Action, the national advocacy initiative that I lead. And we have supported young people to develop minimum standards and a scorecard on meaningful youth engagement. And this takes on a participatory way of governance, which is vital for achieving universal health coverage. So unlike other ways of governance where young citizens wait on governments to make decisions, this takes on a participatory approach where young people actually sit with policymakers and score and track of the young people being engaged in the policy making uh, process, how inclusive has the process been uh, of all the young people who are representative of all the different geographical regions and uh, priorities have they been included in this process. So it takes on a participatory way of governance and it's uh, something that we are rolling out currently. And uh, one other unique factor is that policymakers and um, government leaders actually get to acknowledge the role of the young people in governance and accountability. Um, so in summary, we need to invest in health data gaps for adolescents and youth if young people have to effectively take part in the accountability process. We need to ensure that we formalize and increase uh, meaningful engagement of youth and adolescents in the governance process and in accountability. So as a wrap up, I'd like to say that Amref Health Africa will be holding its second Pan-Africa convening of youth next year, March 3rd to 4th in Kigali, Rwanda. So all youth serving organizations and young people are actually invited to this convening. Um, we'll have over 300 young people and our focus will be skills building on meaningful youth engagement in achieving universal health coverage. And of course, we'll also have skills building sessions um, for young people on holding government leaders accountable to commitments that have been made to end um, HIV and AIDS and increase access to sexual and productive health services and information. So um, everyone is welcome to register, the young people to register, and of course, youth serving organizations um, can hold skills building workshops in our convening that is scheduled to take place next year. Thank you. Okay, uh, great. Thank you very much once again, Evarine, for eloquently handling the whole issue of uh, the praise of young people, the praise of data engagement in policy formulation, accountability, and uh, ensuring right governance mechanisms are in place. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think having listened to the uh, three speakers, uh, we, as we have moved on through this webinar, we have seen questions streaming in. And would like to, and in case you are still typing questions, type them. We'll see them as they come, and if time allows, uh, they will be responded to. We have a few questions here, and a few questions here, and I would like to start with the, with this one. Uh, just a moment. Uh, from Nere Wakamba, uh, Nere Wakamba poses a question. Uh, do we need to come up then with an African governance accountability framework or is there one that exists, a framework that can be adopted and indicators agreed and monitored? We need an African league table on governance in healthcare. Uh, I would like to direct that to uh, Dr. Begashow. Do you want to, do you want to mention to address that? Sure. sure. Uh, <laughs> Currently, we are we're taking the SDG indicators as uh, as a framework. As you know, um, we have about nine indicators around the SDG threes. But one of the effort that we were endeavoring in the last um, one and a half years is trying to um, actually Africanize some of these indicators. We still want to have um, the indicators, the universal agreed indicators, but also we included some other things that are um, specific to Africa. It, is, um, it has to do with malaria, Ebola, and all, all stuff. And, uh, and then some of these things are gender dis disaggregated health issues, but um, showing uh, in the 
gender disaggregated way. So um, it, the index uh, report that we released in June this year um, is an index only for Africa. Um, of course, we are part and parcel of the entire global index, but uh, we have the index that's focusing on Africa with um, <clears throat> such kind of additional indicators into it and additional targets um, exploited. So along with this, we are trying to build um, the health, you know, standard health accountability system because this is a resolution um, that actually resolved during our March 8, 9 meeting this year on, uh, you know, um, strengthening African health accountability system. So we have taken a uh, few countries as a sample where we build um, the ideal uh, and standard health accountability system together with the governments. And then um, if everything goes well, the way it's been planned, we'll be able to actually present this on the coming uh, meeting that AMRIT is organizing in 2019. Um, because one of the resolution is actually to build um, you know, the standard accountability system. So that system is a system that will ensure, uh, actually by being adopted by countries, will ensure the kind of um, accountability, you know, both professional, uh, health, finance, um, access, inclusiveness, all, uh, you know, indicators around that. But at the same time, um, that will also help us um, to Africanize the SDG indexes that we um, start working from last year um, in, a, in a very thorough way. So that's what I would like to say at this stage. And if you guys want to visit this, I think you can go to uh, the www.sdg Center Africa um, website where you can find the index itself. and highlighting that during the conference next year, we'll be going deeper on this. Uh, we really look forward to that, to getting a deep dive into that, into that system in March next year. And uh, there's also a question, we not answer it, but it's still about the framework. It seems very high level. How does this framework incorporate community engagement and mobilization to take on of the UHC initiatives? Uh, so even as we prepare for the uh, Kigali conference, let's really see how do we really make it, uh, uh, it's high level, but how do we make it connect with the grassroots, with the community, uh, with, the com with, the, with the community organizations? We have another question here uh, from uh, specifically directed to Dr. Dovlo. Uh, my question to Dr. Dovlo from Amos Rono. You mentioned about stakeholder engagement, which is an important element of UHC. My question is, at what level do we engage stakeholders, particularly the ones that receive services, I believe communities? Yeah. Uh, for the question. I think you're absolutely right. The engagement has to be at uh, all levels, but what is critically important is that our communities need to be part of this engagement. And I think I mentioned briefly the issue of the capacity building so that they are at the table with equal empowered uh, uh, effort as other stakeholders around, around the table. And you find examples of these in and with mechanisms in, in some of the countries in the region that try to get a community level uh, engaged. I think the point I was trying to make is that uh, uh, each of the levels need to have these efforts uh, taking place in order for it to be effective. Uh, and without that linkage between the decentralized, the most decentralized level, indeed, uh, facility by facility, unit by unit, uh, will not get the sort of results uh, that we want. So I agree with you that we need to engage all of them at each time, that the indicators that we look for should start from the community level and aggregate towards the national level. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Dovlo. Uh, one more question, uh, again directed to you, Dr. Dovlo. Uh, the, or either of you can answer whoever feels more comfortable. The idea of a scorecard is excellent. 
but how, how could the policymakers and service providers be made to respond to the issues raised? It's an excellent idea, but sometimes the issues are not addressed. How do we make the policymakers respond to the issues? Uh, uh, any one of you could answer, yeah. Okay, if I may kick off to give uh, Dr. Begashaw uh, time to come with our deeper answers. I have seen a number of scorecards and, and part of our examples around, for example, the health financing scorecard that the African Union uh, uses to demonstrate how countries are doing around things like out-of-pocket expenditure and domestic investment in health and so on. Uh, the challenge is that it is difficult to see how these would bring about change beyond demonstrating that these changes or there's lack of progress. And the issue is how are these treated, particularly within the specific countries? How are they debated, discussed? And how is that translated into budget processes or into the parliamentary committees and other mechanisms that work within the country? And so for me, that is part of the challenge. And that's why uh, some of us think some of these things should have a forum within the countries, those health summits and uh, performance reviews that countries hold should be based on some of these scorecards being discussed uh, within the country at other levels and countries themselves should have scorecards for their different units of service uh, delivery. Thank you. Uh, then we have a question. Yeah, yes, go on, go on, go on. Yeah, I, I, this is very important. Um, uh, I'm glad uh, <clears throat> this is being raised. I, I think the whole idea is, um, I mean, nothing um, works unless we have very strong political commitment at all levels. This is clear. But we have a feeling that this political commitment is coming now. Um, so um, it, it may depend from countries to countries. But we should not um, actually lose this rare opportunity. And uh, as, as professionals, we need to build that kind of system. We need to build a capable system that will help actually capture this very co important concept. So this is part of the social contract that we are talking. This is about, you know. And then ever than since we have this advantage of having clear time bounded targets. So the scorecard we're talking now is, is cascaded from these big targets and uh, um, 15 years targets. And uh, this is um, one year now, year three or year four next year. Then we should be able to um, you know, put it in the dashboard where exactly that country should be on each of these things. And then that goes all the way to community level actors. Um, and then the community level actors should know exactly what is expected from them on each of these um, targets. And then because the targets are there, their performance can easily be comparable. And then they, the dashboard will show whether they are red or green or yellow, whether they are off track, on track, or you know, achieving these targets. And this should be, this should inform actually, um, you know, from community level to district, district to national, and then the index that we are talking is, the, you know, the highest level of this scorecard aggregated report. So um, last year um, um, we we we've done this, but in June this index released, and and uh, ninety percent of the index report did not include performances from the scorecards because the scorecard implementations are not there. But this year we build a new software and training is happening now um, you know, in each sub-region in order for them to be able to put this information, not only from the government, but from disaggregated level based on that expected targets that goes to each community. And then um, we are aiming actually to um, use the index report in three to four years 100% um, from the scorecard and, um, and because it's a performance report. And then if we use international data, that will be for normatives and standardizations. Right now it is the opposite. So this is how it is. And definitely um, commitment from the government is extremely important. Those countries with uh, that level of commitment, 
they have started working towards this state. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Begashu, for that. Uh, I think, and we look forward to the conference in Rwanda, where certainly I can see there will be a deep dive into those issues uh, of uh, how where scorecards are working and the challenges and how they are being surmounted. Uh, allow me to ask Evelyn a question that has come here. Uh, how do we engage the youth in social accountability? Are there examples that you can give that show youth being engaged? Uh, that's a question from uh, uh, just a moment. Uh, that's a question from Benjamin Katana. Uh, how would we engage youth in accountability uh, for UHC? Yeah. One of the strategies that has really worked when it comes to youth engagement uh, in accountability is the use of social audits. And I'll give the example uh, in the coastal region of Kenya, where young people, as I said initially, young people need to be able to organize themselves in uh, systematic structures to be able then to keep governments accountable to commitments that they have made. So through social audits, uh, young people in Kilifi and Kuala, I think through the Jipangi Youth Organization, were able to organize themselves in civic constituents to actually um, come up and identify priorities that affected them within their region. They're able to develop scorecards. The issue of scorecards has been talked a lot um, here, but this scorecard was specifically related to issues that affected them as young people and with a specific priority on budgeting. The public finance management focus is quite important for young people. We need to be able to understand um, the policies that are being developed at local level, at national level, and at regional level. And that's the only way that uh, we can ensure that these social audits are actually effective. So for young people, if we can organize ourselves and use uh, social audits, that has been a, a, a great strategy for ensuring accountability in governance. Great. Thank you very much, Evelyn. And we really look forward to an exciting engagement with, with the youth in uh, Rwanda, uh, Kigari. Uh, giving examples of what has been working. Uh, allow me to ask one final question because you're running out of time now. And uh, this is an important question. There are so many questions, but we'll answer all of them uh, later on. Uh, from Joy Kihuha, where, what is the role of private sector in this conversation, uh, in financing, in accountability, in governance, strengthening? We have philanthropists in Africa. Where are they in this conversation? That's a question from Joy Kihuha. Uh, do you, Dovlo, Dr. Dovlo, do you want to give a try on that? We are running short of time now, so keep it brief. Yes, yes. I'll try and keep it as short as possible. I think it, it brings up a critical uh, question that I probably didn't address well enough. I think the private sector is going to be critical. It's an integral part of what we are doing. I think what is important is that they are part of the stakeholders and we understand their role and we also have means of holding them accountable to what contributions they make to UHC, as well as ensuring that they have uh, the environment that allows them to contribute in a way, not only to philanthropy, but those areas in providing health that are profitable and that allow a better access to a group of people. Uh, my caution, however, is that without a strong governance element, uh, there are other parts of the private sector that are motivated differently from some of the bigger ones that are part of what we do. And until we, con uh, we are able to manage that adequately, uh, sometimes we will have detrimental effects. But it's critical that they are part, as has been said, of the youth from the beginning of the discussion to the end. And they are part of the monitoring and are also monitored and are held accountable for their contribution within countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Dovlo. Uh, because of time, uh, we will not, uh, we will, would like to add the questions and answer there uh, so that uh, we, we respect time for, for this webinar. Uh, as I mentioned, there are so many questions have come in. I think we have only touched about less than half of them and we'll be responding to all of them uh, in due course. In the next uh, couple of days, uh, we, we should be able to respond to all of them. Once again, uh, thank you, Dr. Dovlo. Thank you, Dr. Begashu. Uh, thank you, uh, Evelyn, for being wonderful speakers. And uh, I also um, thank the, the, all the, our, the listeners, the, the participants in this webinar. And with that, I would like to hand over back to our webinar coordinator, uh, jo Dr. Josphat Nyagero, to help us close this.
Uh, over to you, uh, Josephine. Thank you, Meshak. Thank you, everyone. We have come to the end of uh, our second webinar. And uh, I also now want to take this opportunity to welcome each one of you to our third webinar, which is going to focus on the last response, the last question, the role of public-private partnership in the attainment of universal health coverage in Africa. Thank you once again, be with us. Uh, and this webinar will be held on 10th of December, 2018. Welcome and bye for today. Thank you.